Okay, now let's move on to chapter eight. Um, in the previous unit on cells, we talked about these organelles, the chloroplasts and the mitochondria, and said how they're responsible for processing energy. So we're going to start focusing on them. And this chapter is all about the chloroplasts and the photosynthesis, this process that they carry out. And so energy is going to be a big important part of what we're talking about here and it's important importance for living things because energy is needed for organisms to maintain homeostasis those constant conditions you might think oh constant conditions you just kind of sit there but that's not the way it works it takes work to maintain those constant conditions um, as we'll see to maintain homeostasis organisms need a constant flow of or energy into them um, and of course let's think about energy for a minute so energy can be thought of as different ways the one of the simple ways is energy is sometimes described as the ability to do work or cause change um, energy, electric energy, has the ability to t put our lights on. That's essentially doing a type of work. You can use the energy inside your body to move your muscles and to cause things to change, to move a chair from one side of the room to the other. You're using energy to do that. Um, so, forms of energy. Now, I'm sure from middle school, you're familiar with, of course, potential and kinetic energy and the example of a roller coaster and how when the little cars are at the top of the hill they have potential energy at there at a high point and as they begin to move down the hill that energy is being transformed into kinetic energy the energy of motion um, but now let's think of other types of energy other ways we can think about energy and um, so for example what has energy well basically any kind of all matter has a certain amount of energy in it um, inherent in the bonds of the atoms and the molecules and those things they all have energy and that's of course why when you take something like wood whoops doesn't look good here something like wood and you burn it you're essentially releasing the energy in those chemical bonds <clears throat> All right, now what's going, to, what's going to be most relevant for our discussion of photosynthesis is a form of energy that's quite useful and ubiquitous. Ubiquitous, that would be sunlight. It has a lot of energy, obviously, from the sun. And sunlight contains um, something we'll visit a little later in the chapter, what's called the electro magnetic spectrum it's essentially these wavelengths of energy that are emitted by the sun travel through space and they have various they contain various amounts of energy and the portion of the electromagnetic spectrum that's relevant to photosynthesis is what we know as basically visible light the light that we can see um, Roy G Biv right You've probably heard of that. What is it? Red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, violet, those portions, the, the rainbow, if you will, of colors. <clears throat> All right. Now, other forms of energy that are that exist and are useful. Of course, heat is a form of energy, and it's actually a portion of the electromagnetic spectrum that's not visible. It's sometimes known as infrared radiation and not radiation in the form of radioactivity. It's just a portion of the electromagnetic spectrum. Heat. Now, um, another thing that's going to be very uh, relevant here is also what we might call chemical energy. And this kind of gets at this idea of matter. All matter, all chemicals, all molecules have energy in them. 
And we're going to see in photosynthesis how we have a relationship between sunlight and chemical energy, um, essentially what plants do, converting sunlight into chemical energy, an extremely important process. Now, we need to discuss this guy, this molecule, ATP, adenosine triphosphate. We, it was mentioned briefly in the previous chapter, and we said how it's um, a molecule that can be used to do work in cells, particularly when we talked about active transport. Well, here's a look at adenosine triphosphate. It consists of sort of three parts, if you will, this molecule called adenine, which you can see is an organic molecule with some carbon. It also has a fair amount of nitrogen in it. Um, it's sometimes referred to as a nitrogen base. Then we have ribose here. Ribose, that O-S-E ending like glucose, sucrose, ribose, galactose. It's a sugar molecule. Okay. And again, there's a carbon in each one of these spots. They're just not showing them. And then we have these phosphates, these molecules that have phosphorus and oxygen in them. We have three of them. So, adenosine triphosphate, um, ATP. And what is ATP? It's basically the energy currency inside living things. Okay, it's the molecule that's used to do work inside of us. Um, because ATP, like any molecule, has energy, and the energy can be easily extracted from ATP. You can think of, as, and the book talks about this a bit, as ATP kind of like a charged battery. It's at a higher energy, a relatively high energy level, and you could extract energy from it. So, for example, here's ADP, diphosphate. It only has two as opposed to three. So it's at a lower energy state. So when you add energy to it and an extra phosphate, you get ATP, and it has, you could think of as having a higher charge. So it has more energy and the ability to do work. It's going to show up many times in these next two chapters, this molecule. So some examples of how we use ATP. We talked in the previous chapter about how you can use it to do active transport, to move things against the concentration gradient, to manipulate those membranes and endo and exocytosis. Here's another example of active transport. You don't have to memorize this particular one for this chapter, but it's mentioned in the book, so I want to show it to you this these things called sodium potassium pumps that are very common in organisms, particularly animal cells. And they consist of these membrane proteins that actively pump sodium and potassium ions across cell membranes. And as you can see, ATP provides the energy to do the pumping of these ions across the membrane. Notice that after ATP is provided that energy, it now becomes ADP, that, that less energized form of the molecule. ATP is also used literally in movement, the contractions of our muscles. We'll, we'll see this much later in the fourth chapter when we talk about anatomy. And our muscle consists of largely uh, these uh, protein filaments, the red and the blue things here, that overlap. And when a muscle contracts, those things slide together, going from top to bottom here, and the muscle becomes shorter, and it takes ATP to do that. It provides the energy for these muscle contractions. Another example with fireflies, for example, and these fish that live deep in the ocean, they, they do what's called bioluminescence. Um, they do a chemical reaction that emits a light, and ATP is an important player in this process of converting this one molecule, luciferin, to this other molecule. And in the process of doing that, light is emitted. OK, so those are just three examples of how ATP is used as a source of energy.
Now, energy in living things, in us, and our cells, and the plants, how do we store energy? We really don't store energy long-term as ATP. ATP is a very temporary form of energy storage. Living things tend to store energy more long-term as carbohydrates, as lipids, basically fats and oils, fats and animals, and to a certain extent in proteins. But lipids and carbs are sort of the primary way we store energy. And we're going to see in the next chapter, one about cellular respiration, how we extract energy from these molecules to generate ATP, this temporary source of energy. All right, autotrophs and heterotrophs. These are ecological terms that refer to particular kinds of organisms that you find out there in nature. Autotrophs are organisms that make their own food. Plants and algae are the primary types of autotrophs we have on planet Earth. Forests full of autotrophs. Here's this aquatic plant we looked at from our fish tank with those chloroplasts in there. These organelles whose job is going to be to make that food. On the other hand, we have heterotrophs. Heterotrophs are organisms that cannot make their own food, but to get their energy, they have to consume food, like this little tyke here is doing in this bear. So animals are heterotrophs. Fungi are heterotrophs. Here's an amoeba, a type of protista, that is a heterotroph. They have to consume food to get their energy. And so autotrophs and heterotrophs are, of course, related or interconnected in natural systems because, as we see, the autotrophs, they're the ones that make food. In an ecological sense, they're known as these producers. They make food. Whereas heterotrophs are known as consumers. They have to consume food to get their energy. And of course, that food comes from autotrophs because they're the ones making it. And so as we consume that food, we're essentially consuming compounds that contain energy that, as you can see, ultimately came from the sun. The sun was used by those plants to make that food, and then we consume the food to get that energy. <clears throat> so, the process that these autotrophs use is indeed this process we know as photosynthesis that we'll look at in more detail later in this chapter. But for now, we just can think of it as essentially the process by which plants and algae use sunlight and they are able to convert that sunlight energy into chemical energy, essentially the energy in our foods, primarily sugars. Um, now, um, at this point the book goes through a little bit of a history lesson. Um, this is on page 229, and I'll talk about this in more detail in class because I'm running out of time on this video, but we'll see this guy, Von Helmont. He um, noticed that, of course, when you put a plant in a pot, the plant, of course, gets bigger, and he wondered, okay, where is the material coming from for that plant to get bigger because the amount of soil in the pot doesn't change? Where does it come from? We'll talk about his ideas. Priestley did this interesting experiment where he noticed that if you have some kind of animal in an airtight container, of course, what happens to it eventually suffocates. And if you put a candle in there, the candle eventually snuffs out. Why is that? Uh, but now, when he added a plant, the animal could stay alive and the flame could keep burning. What is it about the plant's presence that allows that flame to keep burning? Von Ingenhaus, he um, looked at plants and how they released these bubbles, but that would only happen when there was light present. What's going on there? 
this guy julius robert van meyer.